Moy. I'm the GM for uh, Intelligent Technology, uh, international business uh, based in Singapore. Um, so essentially, um, you know, I'm wearing a mask because I'm in office, but, uh, you know, still really glad to be able to be back in office. Yeah. So can't wait uh, for the interaction uh, that's going to follow after this uh, webinar. I'm quite sure there's going to be so much discussion and uh, opportunities together. But uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Derek. And next we have Richard Ng. So he is the blockchain developer from Pundi X Labs. Um, the floor is all yours, Richard, to do an introduction. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Richard. I work with uh, Pundi X as a blockchain developer. And my goal in this um, blockchain ecosystem is to churn out uh, very interesting and exciting uh, products like the de decentralized applications. And also, you know, to uh, hopefully provide the mass the masses with um, good information and accurate information instead of maybe relying on Elon Musk tweets for, about blockchain. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, and last but not least, we have Daniel Leverick. So he is the VP of Digital and Data Solutions from Zuelik Pharma. Um, Daniel, you can do a quick introduction from yourself. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Leverick. Um, I'm VP of, of Digital and Data for, um, for Zulik Pharma. Um, I'm here, uh, honoured to be here today to, to really share uh, the story of what we are doing in the in the pharma blockchain space. Uh, maybe to to kind of show to everybody that that blockchain is not all crypto. Uh, there is other use cases, and, and really uh, happy to be be part of this panel and be able to share the story of Zulik Pharma. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. So um, for Pinky, we, um, she will be joining in the panel discussion session and she will be helping um, as the moderator later on. So just a quickly run through, we have the agenda for today. So first, um, we have the presentation from Derek Loy, followed by um, Richard Ang that he will be talking about blockchain ecosystem and platform. And then last but not least, we have Daniel Leverick who he will be presenting about um, case study from Easy Tracker and also blockchain application in pharmaceutical industries and followed by a panel discussion that will be moderated by Kim. And um, just a couple housekeeping rules. So please, um, for all, all audiences, mute your microphone when you are not speaking so people can um, listen to the um, sessions clearly. Also, if you have any questions, please kindly um, post it in the chat box and um, we will be helping to answer the questions as well. And with all that, I can give the floor to Ibu Asi to do a quick introduction from ABI. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Darlene. I think I have a presentation. Uh, can you please help share the screen? So I think I'm just going to greet everyone first. Uh, Derek Loy, Richard Ng, Daniel Leverick, Pinky May Sky, and all of our guests today, welcome. I think before we deep dive into the main topic of the session, so please allow me to do a quick update on blockchain industry in Indonesia. Yep, I will share more about the association. Um, I think this is, can capture the collective efforts of the Indonesian uh, blockchain community that have been we've been doing together. So yeah, the association was established in 2017 by the very first seven blockchain projects, and we were inaugurated on 2018 by the chairman of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, or Kadin. And at that time, crypto was a hype. You know, we discussed with our trade ministry for quite some time. And on 2018, they issued a policy for crypto as a commodity that can be traded legally. And following on the policy on to 2019, under the trade ministry, the Commodity Futures Trading Authority, or COFTRA, or we call it BAPTI, issued a technical procedure of crypto trading. And it has been evolving this past uh, couple of years because um, they want to make sure that Indonesian market can remain competitive with the global market. And on the same year, we also did one of the biggest hackathons with one of the biggest banks in Southeast Asia and attracted a lot of um, novice to master chain developers from Southeast Asia. Uh, so we can see that banks have been seeing blockchain not as a threat, but more as an opportunity for them to be an early adopter. And on 2020, thanks to the Indonesian Ministry of Communications and Informatics for issuing the Indonesia Standard Industrial Classification, or we call it KBLE for blockchain projects. And that year was the first time we did our official annual conference, Indonesian Blockchain Conference 2020, that involved the regulators and industry players in one big forum. And we also did the IBC this year on last August, and we can see the interest were hugely growing. 
early this year, we co-founded the ASEAN Blockchain Consortium. I think maybe some of you already are familiar with it, uh, with five Southeast Asian nations plus Australia. And we also co-founded a Blockchain Association Forum, which is more of a global scale. And these two institutions aim to engage with regulators to ensure legal compliance alongside uh, raising industry awareness and education. Um, also, the association was planning to have this Blockchain Council principally as an ethics committee that will track on the development of the ecosystem. And until now, well, this is still something that ABI does. So we'll see if the urgency and opportunity show themselves probably on the next year. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the Indonesian blockchain landscape. Uh, we update it every year. Back to when we established the association in 2017, there were only seven blockchain projects. Now there are more than 60 working blockchain projects. There are many real working blockchain use cases for taxation, supply chain, financial services, um, gaming, crypto exchanges, of course, and so on. And recently we were having a discussion with one of our ministries and planning to have a halal blockchain, basically for the halal certification process. Uh, we also have been discussing with the other policymakers so getting how they can actually regulate or facilitate the industry that has a very fast face, you know, and we're helping them with compiling the blockchain related policies from all around the world. Hopefully that can give a picture of the state blockchain on specific countries and how um, it can in fact uh, contribute to the development of a country. So the cross sector dialects are something common now in Indonesia and we have been pushing them to start implementing it and see the impact. So I think that's a quick update on the blockchain industry in Indonesia. Please enjoy the rest of the discussions and back to you, Darwin. Thank you, Biasi, for the introduction from um, Asociasi Blockchain Indonesia. So next, we will have um, Derek from N Group, and he will be presenting about connecting the dots between treaties, um, tokenization, trust, and trade. Um, the floor is all yours, Derek. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Darlene. Uh, can all of you see my slides? Um, yes, we can see it. Awesome, awesome. So um, again, uh, you know, just to say hi to, to those people who have just joined us. Uh, my name is Derek Loy, GM for International Business for Intelligent Technology uh, and Group. So today, uh, you know, I, um, I would love to actually just share some insights uh, and perspective, uh, you know, from N Group with regards to how we are seeing the industry uh, actually connecting the dots, right, between the three T's, uh, tokenization, trust and trade, right? There, is, there seems to be uh, you know, taking the uh, industry by storm. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll skip through the uh, synopsis uh, because I think let's jump straight uh, to the uh, discussion. Uh, you might want to, I, I usually would like to start off with a quick introduction of uh, who is Ant, right? Um, you know, Ant is a, 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 fin a financial technology uh, services company uh, that aims to create the infrastructure and platform to support the digital trans transformation of the uh, service industry. Uh, we are known as the owner and operator of Alipay, right? well, one of the leading uh, digital payment platforms uh, worldwide. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we have also recently introduced uh, Enchain Plus, which is all about using the trusted technology components uh, to enable trust and connect business. Right? So this is um, where I'll be sharing more uh, a little bit today. Um, you know, let's start off with first a you know a quick overview of some of the use cases for uh, Enchain, right? Um, but even before that, right? I think uh, for me, it's probably going to be uh, preaching to the choir here, so to speak. Um, in in the sense that we all understand, you know, the the some of the characteristics uh, of blockchain with regards to immutability. Uh, decentralized, uh, you know, transparency that's really make it very relevant uh, for some of the industry use cases. Now, specifically uh, for Ant, uh, we have close to about 50 plus industry use cases that we have um, landed uh, into, uh, you know, real world customers, real world use cases. And uh, this ranges from copyright protection, uh, you know, especially with regards to uh, you know, digital media, uh, prints, digital art, uh, you know, in, uh, brand protection, you know, and end of the day, you know, how it all comes together from policing to uh, legal enforcement, right? So this is something which uh, has seen a huge uh, increase recently, uh, especially since now more of us are consuming uh, digital content from home. And, and therefore, there's a need for, 
uh, the uh, suitable monetization, right, and protection of all these uh, IP assets, uh, so that the uh, creative owners uh, or creators are motiv mo motivated and monetized uh, to actually continue to create new content for all of us to enjoy. All right, so this is even more relevant today. Uh, the other area that we are seeing a huge increase is in supply chain finance. And this is uh, to, you know, in combination with obviously the uptick in digital trade, uh, you know, as we see more of uh, cross-border digital trade happening. Uh, this is obviously, again, uh, accelerated by the pandemic, which has driven an online explosion of uh, transactions uh, or, or what they call an explosion of transactions online. But more importantly, you know, it is also due to the fact that, uh, you know, this uh, uh, area all right, of supply chain finance has also gotten a lot more mature, a lot more secure, which has given a lot more confidence right, to the uh, parties uh, who are now transacting and trading uh, across uh, you know, international borders. Now, last but not least, um, you know, I also want to mention the fact that it has been helped by some of these uh, free trade agreements or what you call trade agreements that have been signed. Uh, take, for example, our RCEP, right? Uh, is starting in January of 2022 and is uh, the world's largest uh, trade agreement that has been signed in recent years, right? So that will definitely promote uh, digital trade uh, between ASEAN as well as uh, China and many other countries uh, in this region. Uh, last but not least, from a trade finance point of view, um, you know, it is also an area where we have seen a lot of uptake, especially with regards to marketplace. Uh, you know, establishing the data exchange uh, between SMEs uh, so that, again, it's all about enabling that uh, ability to trade uh, and also with the corresponding assurance from a logistic, uh, from a, a supply chain assurance perspective. Now, today I would like to, you know, dive a bit deeper into three areas, right, where we are coincidentally, they are all starting with T, right? So let's start off with tokenization. And for me, right, uh, I want to emphasize the fact that it is about keeping it real uh, because there, there has been a lot of uh, discussions about whether there's a bubble. Uh, and, and for us, you know, uh, we have always been very focused on keeping it real. Now, but let's start off with an understanding of what is tokenization, right? And tokenization, as we understand it, is about how a, uh, you know, an actual contract in the real world, you know, that, that is, uh, representing a claim or a right to some goods and services is now digitized right uh, onto a smart contract right and this is then represented uh, in the form of a token right in the blockchain world right so that's a very simplistic definition of uh, tokenization and as we all know uh, there are many many types of tokens um, you know there are tokens uh, such as uh, uh, you know payment tokens which we are um, you know, sorry, there are, there are uh, payment tokens that we are most familiar with, uh, such as Bitcoin, so on and so forth, which we are not going to talk about today. Uh, that's also an area which N Group does not participate uh, in uh, due to our financial regulations. But there are also, uh, you know, other use cases for tokens which uh, have been overshadowed, right, by the cryptocurrency and the payment token. And those are the areas of security token, utility token, and governance token, right? And, and these are the areas which I would like to give some uh, practical use case examples of where uh, N has been uh, enabling some of our customers. So moving on, uh, let's start off with, uh, uh, you know, one example of uh, token that has definitely caught the world by storm recently, and that is in the area of NFT. Uh, you know, in ants, we prefer to call it digital collectibles because we, we focus a lot more on uh, the actual practical value you know, of how it actually promotes a digital uh, identity and ownership, you know, for certain uh, digital creatives, digital art. Uh, we focus less, in fact, or, and we discourage uh, market uh, trading and manipulation, which we feel is uh, sometimes, um, you know, not really reflecting the value of uh, NFTs. So from a digital collectible per perspective, uh, this uh, slide illustrates some of the capabilities that we have 
where we work with our clients to uh, you know, convert some of the uh, assets uh, into uh, NFTs. And uh, in some cases, we will even create 3D renditions, uh, which I hope the graphics will show here. Yeah, correct. So this is one of the earlier version. Obviously, we have evolved it further. But you can see this really helps to bring alive right? some of this digital art uh, you know, where there's a digital uh, twin that's created. And that really helps to promote the, and, and, and deepen right? the exchange of cultural uh, you know, and art culture and art exchange uh, you know, between nations and even between uh, art clusters. Now, just a, a matter of note is that, uh, as you know, there'll be uh, a Hangzhou, uh, there'll be an Asian Games in Hangzhou, uh, they will be happening in uh, June of this year. And uh, we actually uh, created an NFT for the torch, uh, which was uh, literally sold out, right? Uh, within a few hours, uh, a few seconds, sorry, a few, a few uh, minutes after it was put on hold. Uh, and and that, that again is a, a good example of how NFT, uh, you know, can have a very wide range or wide coverage but at the same time, it is also uh, uh, it can be also put to good practical use, right? So twenty thousand of the NFT uh, that was issued for the twenty twenty two Asian Games uh, was sold out within a second, right? After being made available at uh, our Alipay uh, NFT platform at uh, twelve p.m. on Thursday, September sixteen. Um, in terms of uh, uh, NFT. Uh, you know, there are a couple of options uh, that we are seeing that's most relevant uh, to a lot of our clients uh, who have been uh, wanting to get onto the bandwagon, but at the same time, they are very practical. Uh, they're looking at how they can make it a lot more sustainable. Um, but so far, uh, based on experience, what we are seeing is uh, option one, where there are clients who look at creating an NFT marketplace uh, that's based on Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, then subsequently, once they, they have built up that marketplace, once they have gotten all the smart contract and all the uh, minting uh, capabilities in place, then they are looking at how they can set up a market, uh, a transaction uh, capability for that, right? And that is where it could be on Ethereum with lazy minting. Uh, and that's so important today because of the gas fee. Uh, next would be, you know, another option, which is to build a side chain, a layer two side chain that's bridgeable to Ethereum uh, with uh, zero K roll up uh, so as to ensure the right security, right? So this is, uh, you know, an example, right? Of the scope of work that we're seeing from uh, a lot of the enterprise customers who are hoping to jump onto the NFT bandwagon, but not so much for, uh, you know, just a pure um, market, uh, uh, what do you call that, speculation. Uh, these are for practical use cases where it's about uh, you know, trying to promote uh, or enable, right, a, a virtual uh, go-to-market for some of their assets, all right, or some of their products and services. Um, so that was a quick uh, overview of what we do for uh, util uh, one of the types of utility token, which is NFT, uh, digital collectibles. Another example for utility token is with regards to omni-channel downstream monetization. And uh, this is something that we do with one of our partners called Verofax, where, uh, you know, just for fictitious example sake, uh, Asahi, you know, is, is, a, uh, is one of the beverages, uh, you know, that is known. Uh, again, like I stressed, this is just an example. But, um, you know, in this case, uh, you know, Asahi might want to actually create a engine or mechanism to better, uh, you know, engage with their consumers uh, after a certain promotion. Uh, where they would like to also give assurance to their consumers that uh, the beer is fresh and coming from a certain location and is arriving within a certain number of days. Uh, this is where with the right token that's created, uh, we are able to integrate it into a wallet and, with, and, and a mobile app. And this allows for a consumer engagement, which is so important, especially with regards to you know, uh, some experiential uh, promotion, discount at certain uh, outlets. Uh, there could also be gamification that's introduced. On top of that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for certain uh, FMCG, uh, it's also to give customers the assurance that uh, you know this uh, uh, this particular uh, you know beverage or, or food item has been uh, you know shipped 
uh, or has been, uh, you know, uh, coming is actually coming from a certain source, right? So this is uh, the logistic interaction that we're talking about. And last but not least, obviously, it's about uh, increasing uh, the interaction, the the possible uh, the tracking of the sales, and how do you actually have that omni-channel uh, consumer engagement after that first encounter, right, or the first contact? So this is where um, we we do see a more practical use case for utility tokens, uh, you know, that we are engaging with some of our customers. Um, so, so those are just quick examples, uh, you know, that I wanted to share. Next, let me talk a bit more about trust, right, which is the second T. Uh, and trust, uh, you know, in, in my view, is actually the currency of the new digital economy, uh, much more than data, right? Data, uh, we have reached a stage, uh, you know, in our, uh, you know, industry uh, evolution where there's a lot of data online or, or even from our daily transaction. It is about now how we actually um, extract the right insights from this data so that we are able to gain trust and therefore uh, choose to work with a certain party, right? So that is actually how we see now uh, the digital economy evolving with trust as the currency of this new digital economy. And, and you know, what better way to start than to talk about, you know, some recent incidents um, where, for example, cream uh, finance, uh, you know, they actually experienced their third, uh, you know, security uh, uh, incident where they have, uh, again, um, you know, had uh, quite a bit of, uh, uh, currency, cryptocurrency that's stolen from their wallets, right? So that has obviously affected their share price. Um, at the same time, um, the uh, the other recent incident is uh, Poly Network, right? Where they have uh, lost close to about 600 million, uh, you know, due to a, uh, a uh, flaw, right? Within the uh, cross uh, chain uh, re-entry. And, um, you know, they actually, uh, reach out to the to their to their consumer base, right, or to their uh, community, and uh, they managed to recover half of that, right. So that that is really interesting. Um, you know, one of the in, one of the findings from this was the fact that um, you know a lot of the money or half the money was returned because uh, you know why why is unknown, you know exactly uh, who the Parties are who actually managed to, uh, you know, uh, get this uh, uh, close to 600 million uh, that is uh, accidentally uh, put into their wallets. But at the same mm. time, uh, it is known that if they do make any subsequent transactions, that can be tracked, right? So that, that is why half of that was actually returned, right? So so that those are two incidents which really does still uh, give us a, some room to consider. Right, on what else and how else can we improve uh, in terms of uh, the various tokenization capabilities that we have today. Now, in this regard, right, um, I think and uh, for us, we, we therefore focus a lot on the smart contract and the audit of uh, smart contract. Uh, we have identified four areas uh, that poses a concern. Uh, of no doubt, uh, first will be definitely the code itself, right? So the code security, the vulnerability, uh, especially with regards to integer overflow, which results in the risk of unauthorized coins. Next will be the logic vulnerability, right? Uh, an example with the balancer and how that actually resets and causes some uh, uh, black track. Third will be business vulnerability, the logic itself, the, the business logic itself. And this would be uh, a very good example would be how uh, an attack could be caused by a unit price calculation of the LP. Um, the last will be the cross-chain vulnerability, which is uh, what was uh, uh, identified as one of the key uh, challenges uh, for um, sorry, the sharing got stopped. Let me just resume the sharing. Yep. Okay, and the last will be the cross-chain security, and, and this is um, you know, re, uh, evolving around how there could be a re-entry uh, uh, due to a vulnerability in the ERC-777, right? So this is what was identified as some of the, uh, as one of the main culprit uh, in the previous two security, security incidents that I mentioned. 
So these are the four areas uh, you know, that we actually do uh, smart contract audits around. And the angle that we take around such uh, smart contract uh, analysis is the multi-angle approach. So obviously there will be a formal verification by a business logic validation. Uh, in, uh, after that, you know, we'll do a fuzzy test, especially with regards to identifying unknown incremental vulnerability scans. And then last but not least, a static analysis right, of the known vulnerability types. Um, so, so that's the uh, second area, which is uh, the second T, which is uh, uh, trust. Then next, uh, you know, how do we all bring it together, right? With the right trust, with the right tokenization, how do we enable trade? And, you know, to, to us, right, therefore, you know, with the right tokenization and trust, it empowers digital trade, which then connects B2B to B to C. And this is where, um, you know, Anne has also made a lot of uh, F, uh, what do you call, uh, progress, right, in terms of uh, building a global uh, blockchain transmission network that connects up, uh, you know, multiple banks across the world, the multiple banks and wallets such as DBS in Singapore, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, Krishi Bank in Thailand, BBVA in Spain, and uh, we have worked with them to then avail a, uh, you know, a payment as well as a settlement platform uh, known as Trustpo. Right, T R U S P L E Trustful, um, that uh, had actually automates the entire BPU process between the buyer and seller. Now, this typical process, uh, you know, where a buyer and seller uh, identify and connects with each other and, and finally make a settlement or payment, you know, for some certain goods and services, uh, would usually take easily four to six weeks, uh, you know, as they have to bring in the right banks in order to provide the letter of credit. Uh, you know, to actually uh, under, under uh, what do you call, uh, to, to secure the payment, right? So that is typically what happens in the past, but currently with Trustpo, uh, it actually allows for such uh, transactions to be completed in a matter of few days. And this also uh, avails some of the partner capabilities uh, from our bank and our, our shipping uh, partners uh, that enables uh, the, 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 you know, the tracking Right and and the, the ability to actually uh, match the payment against the shipment milestones. Another area that uh, we have uh, connected the dots uh, to really promote digital trade is around uh, copyright protection. Right, uh, you know, and I, I'm going to skip over uh, you know what you know typically about copyright protection with regards to digital media because I think that's pretty well known. But an area which uh, we are really proud of recently that we have launched is whereby, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, is is also about the protection of uh, NFTs and IP digital assets. Right. So can you imagine if there's a certain uh, digital asset that's created by you and me, right? Uh, and we decide to, you know, NFT it. Uh, we decide to mint it. But at the same time, you know, uh, there's a, a the huge potential commercialization where a certain hat manufacturer or a certain t-shirt manufacturer would love to actually, uh, you know, uh, commercialize uh, your, your digital asset, you know, a certain logo or a certain digital art that you have created onto, uh, you know, t-shirts, hats uh, that they can sell on a certain e-commerce platform, right? So that itself, uh, you know, uh, as a source or a stream of monetization, a downstream source of monetization, is uh, what we have enabled with uh, one of our recent capabilities called Chue Tao, right? Uh, which is uh, built upon Enchain. And uh, this really helps to automate the entire uh, protection of that uh, IP asset, the digital asset, enabling a uh, merchant to be able to monetize it, uh, you know, either via t-shirts, hats, you know, various other means. And then, you know, to also uh, automate the distribution or the revenue share, right, of uh, each, uh, you know, purchase of that T-shirt or hat uh, downstream, uh, sorry, upstream, so that, uh, you know, it is real time. Uh, and this really, uh, A, is fair, right? B, it is, uh, you know, it doesn't involve an upfront uh, payment, you know, of uh, to the licensee owner. Uh, so it actually allows, lowers the barrier of entry for, uh, you know, a lot more um, participants uh, to jump onto this bandwagon and ensure IP copyright protection. And last but not least, 
it really offers another avenue of monetization for uh, NFT and a lot of the digital assets that are being created, right? So this is something which we are very proud of because again, uh, you know, for, for N Group, we are, uh, you know, we are, we are more focused on the real world use cases uh, for NFTs. And we believe this is one of them uh, rather than to just, uh, you know, offer it up for, for trading and for uh, market, uh, you know, uh, speculation. So we are opposed to that. Uh, the other area that I, I think is, uh, so this slide actually explained uh, what I've just mentioned earlier, All right. Uh, so with Chia Tao, you know, it's an end-to-end -end copyright uh, protection that's built on blockchain. It connects between the uh, seller and the buyer, all right, and uh, it brings in obviously, uh, you know, the protection and management of the IP assets. Uh, it automates the commercialization, right, especially in terms of the revenue distribution. And last but not least, with the right e-commerce platform, it also allows for the merchandising, the product management, and the, and the right operation tools to monitor uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, you know, sales and delivery right, of such uh, goods that are created from the IP assets. Right? So this is, again, you know, uh, something which really you know, allows us to now have that transparency uh, you know, and, and this is uh, most importantly, right? It lowers the barrier entry for commercialization. So I just want to end off this slide. Um, I know there's a lot to talk about today uh, and I've tried to keep it very focused on uh, the three Ts, right? Tokenization, trust as well as trade and given you some practical uh, use cases uh, that we are working with our customers. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about uh, you know, trust, right? It's all about enabling trust and connecting business. So at this moment, we have a daily volume of close to about 100 million uh, digital assets that's uh, uploaded and updated on our uh, chains, on our ledgers uh, globally. Uh, as I've mentioned, we have uh, landed about 50 uh, use cases, uh, including some that I've shown you earlier, um, you know, and continue to do so uh, to, to, to innovate with our customers. And, you know, we are also very proud of the fact that we are leading the world, right, in terms of uh, the number of patents that we have fought around blockchain. So currently it's about close to about 2,200 plus and lead and, and growing, right? And we are leading uh, the world in terms of the number of patents. Uh, we have also been recognized uh, by IDC, by Gartner, by Forbes, uh, you know, uh, to be among the world tops uh, blockchain company uh, based on industry use cases. And we continue to align to various industry standards, right? We should always, um, you know, uh, firmly believe as uh, the best way to, to, to also ensure global consistency. So that's all I wanted to share today. I know it's a bit fast, but uh, happy to take any questions later on. Uh, back to you, Dalin. Thank you, Derek, for the sharing today. So um, we were able to understand on the three T's that are shaping the digital economy today, as well as, as, well as the three key trends in trust, tokenization, and digital trade. And also we were able to understand on um, blockchain-based copyright, as well as IP trading platform from MD. So next session, we will be having um, Richard Ng from Pundi X Labs, and he will be um, presenting about blockchain ecosystem and platform. The floor is all yours, Richard. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Thank you. All right, so hi, I'm Richard. Uh, so today I'll be running you through um, how the blockchain ecosystem works you know, from governance participation to borderless payment and to decentralized financial services. So blockchain is really redefining trust as we know it. So trust in this world right now is, I would say it's a very elusive term. You know, everyone wants it, but, you know, no one can really have it. And, you know, blockchain actually answers quite a bit of questions with regards to trust. So this is the current... Um, state of our financial uh, ecosystem right now. Let's say I want to send money across the world, okay? So let's say Bob resides in Singapore while Alice resides in maybe Africa. So if Bob, say, uh, Bob wants to send $100 to Alice, he has to go through bank A, maybe a local bank A, and then goes to uh, intermediary bank A, and finally goes to maybe global bank B, 
and finally reaches you know uh, the local bank in Africa where Alice resides in. So for those of you who have done any kind of cross-border payment, you know um, the issue with this. So it really kind of highlights um, the inefficiencies of the system. And maybe after all the transaction fees have uh, been incurred, the $100 will only be $50 that's left. So our whole financial system is only a system of ledger. And then when sending money is just, you know, an entry into that ledger. So this begs the question on um, which ledger do you trust, right? So in 08 financial crisis, right, for those of you who are unaware, um, you know, like Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, you know, all these big banks, you, they always say too big to fail, right? So what they do behind the scene is that, you know, because the housing prices were going up, and they were issuing out loans even to subprime uh, borrowers. So we don't really know um, which ledger to trust. And even now with the Evergrande uh, issue in or Evergrande event in, in China, we don't really, I mean, with such huge uh, real estate companies or with such huge uh, financial institutions, we don't know who to trust. Right? So that brings us to the point of decentralization. So in blockchain, everyone talks about this. Um, there, I mean, there's a couple of characteristics, but one of them is decentralization. So essentially, each member has an exact same copy of this distributed ledger for complete transparency, especially if you know, you're either a full node or validator node. So this ensures that the entire system will not break down upon a single point of failure. So in the current uh, financial system, let's say I want to go to bank A and I want to withdraw $5, right? So this bank A will hold this ledger and he'll check the balance, say I have $100. So I'm able to withdraw $5. But if I go to bank B, who doesn't share this ledger, okay, I wouldn't be able to withdraw that $5, All right? So in, in this blockchain ecosystem, right? If let's say there are 100 nodes, uh, all fully synced up to the latest state of the blockchain. I can instead, you know, go to each one of the node, let's say node A or node B, and just ask whether I can withdraw $5 instead. And, you know, everyone will have a copy of my balance saying that I'm able to withdraw $100. So that kind of uh, allows, you know, or emphasizes or enforces decentralization in our ecosystem. And also at uh, any data once written on the blockchain cannot be changed or removed. So this really enforces, you know, um, immutability. So it enables record keeping in different fields like court records, uh, university degree records, digital voting even. And, you know, that makes it impossible to forge records. So I know in some countries, you know, you can actually uh, walk down the street, the night market, and you can actually ask people to help you forge university degrees. And, you know, you can probably land a very good job using that. So blockchain actually helps in this kind of um, uh, areas where, you know, uh, you can, it's quite impossible to forge records. So one, one example would be uh, OpenCert, you know, which is a Singapore-based uh, uh, government-funded project. Uh, now moving on to peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so the idea or the concept of blockchain uh, allows interaction with between two parties to be accomplished without the need of any third party. So if uh, going back to the previous example about uh, doing cross-border payment, right? Um, and, you know, like just giving a new example, like when um, Bob now goes to Alice's uh, outlet to buy, say, a merchandise or clothes, right? So when one, the moment he taps uh, his credit card on the, the card reader, uh, in the back end, you know, there's this transaction that happens with the bank. And, you know, it requires a third party to clear off uh, any kind of transaction before Alice receives her money. So in our, in our uh, blockchain ecosystem, actually, we do away with the third, uh, the, the third party and the middleman. So uh, because of this um, trustless system, we are able to facilitate this kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transaction. And, you know, that really expedites cross-border transactions and, you know, remove the need for any trust in the system. So what we do in uh, Pundi X is that we provide blockchain solutions 
and services uh, for companies which are exploring to implement blockchain technology for reducing overhead costs, increasing collaboration with partners, and to drive greater business efficiencies. So some of our current solutions, I would break it down into two major components. Uh, one I would say is more towards the hardware and end-to-end -to -end payment solution, as well as a decentralized data service solution, which I'll touch on later, as well as you know, the software kind of the business, uh, which is Function X or FX Core, which allows for more decentralized uh, data uh, on the internet and providing a safe and secure automated environment to operate in. So more about Function X. Um, basically, it bridged the traditional and decentralized markets. That's our main aim. So we are mirroring traditional financial products like, uh, you know, your market makers, you know, a, a digital exchange, or even things like um, new products like dApps, you know, decentralized uh, applications or NFTs, right? And all this will be built on Function X. So. One of our value proposition for Function X or FX Core is that, um, okay, take for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's main value proposition is that it solves the payment issue. Okay, other than payment, you can't really do anything in the blockchain, uh, in the Bitcoin network. All right, then um, slowly after two, three years, you know, Ethereum came up and Ethereum came up with the idea of smart contracts. So, you know, you can um, deploy uh, decentralized apps and as you might know the latest boom you know nfts right paris hilton uh, having her own brand of nfts so i'll liken um, all these blockchains to have their own major use cases and where does fx core or where does function x stand in all of this is that uh taking an analogy for example right bitcoin uh, i would like to liken it to a zoo okay so Bitcoin is like the lion enclosure and, you know, Ethereum is like your giraffe enclosure. So if you go to the zoo, you know, you, you want to see a variety of animals. You don't want to just use, uh, just don't want to see just lions or you don't want to see just giraffes. So Function X is take it as the zoo is a hub that allows all the different blockchains to connect to it. All right. And with, you know, cross-chain mechanism and cross-chain validation, this allows it to be possible. So um, just elaborating on that as well. So FX Core is our proprietary blockchain uh, hub or blockchain network. And we have, uh, we implemented a cross-chain bridge as well, as well as a multi-chain structure. So uh, not going too much into details, but um, how this works is that, you know, any chain I can, any chain that's connected to this FX Core hub, it will allow easy transaction. For example, if I want to, send money from the Ethereum network all the way to the Bitcoin network. If both chains are linked up to our FX core, that would be very easy. Okay, so that involves, you know, uh, burning or locking tokens on one end and minting them on the other. And then, you know, there's a cross-chain validation to make sure that uh, this transaction is correct. Okay, and um, we are actually built on a proof of stake consensus model. So, you know, the newer generations of blockchains are mainly predominantly proof of stake. So Cardano, Solana, and the older generations of blockchain like uh, Ethereum 1.0 and Bitcoin, they're mainly using proof of work. So proof of work is um, very highly uh, energy intensive, right? That's why, you know, you have people like Elon Musk saying that Bitcoin mining is uh, turning the environment uh, into a very bad place, right? Uh, and, you know, like the whole point of uh, proof of stake now is that, you know, we have a much lower um, barrier to entry in terms of hardware requirement. You don't need like servers and servers or, you know, ASICs or GPUs to mine or to be part of the network. Okay, so this really also helps with, uh, you know, cloud solutions as well, like Alibaba. So some of the solutions that we've uh, employed or deployed uh, it also uses uh, Ali Cloud. So some of the validators that we have uh, are based on um, a cloud instance. So moving on to decentralized government, um, validators and delegators uh, on F Function X 
blockchain uh, or FX core can vote on any proposals that can change parameters or you know use uh, the fund for let's say an NF to build an NFT marketplace, right? And to also coordinate upgrades. So uh, some of you might know, like when you attend an annual general meeting of a company, right? Um, people go there, you know, every once in a year to listen to the a board of directors uh, speaking, you know, about in boring terms about what they're going to do next or pushing or motioning for a proposal. And then, you know, finally you get to vote for it. Some people just go there to have free food. Uh, yeah, my, I know some people who do. And, you know, like uh, in our case, decentralized government, uh, as long as, you know, you have enough money, you can actually push for a proposal. You can, you can send or you can broadcast the proposal out to the entire network and everyone can vote on it. So you don't have to wait one year. Okay, you can, you can do it from your, the comfort of your home or even while you're driving, you can just uh, propose like a new governance proposal and then you can even vote on it. So that really changes the entire landscape of you know, how we think about governance. So FX Core Network right now, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we can process up to 20,000 uh, transactions per block. And the average block time is about five seconds. And right now, because we are kind of a new chain, a very new chain actually, uh, the transactions that have already processed are 160,000. All right, so this number is actually just going to look like it's, uh, it's go just going to grow at an exponential rate. So the other arm of our business is uh, the hardware business which includes like the expos, your X wallet and your X pass. So, um, you know, when you go to a merchant outlet, right, you have a POS system and then, you know, you tap your credit card and the transaction goes through. So instead we have this solution that uh, called the expos. So merchants will hold this and, you know, like uh, the X wallet and X pass, they all, um, they are user interface where users can use them and store their cryptocurrency. So the catch is that in this entire ecosystem, we won't be using fiat for any kind of payment. Okay, we'll be using cryptocurrencies. So this really um, opens up the gateway to uh, the real world, you know, because right now, especially, you know, everyone talks about the metaverse. Everyone lives uh, in, a, in a world of gaming, you know, coming up with NFTs. Uh, no one really thinks about crypto as a form of payment or exchange of goods. So a lot of economists believe that, you know, um, crypto doesn't have financial value outside of the uh, digital world. So I think this whole entire ecosystem of Expos, X Wallet and X Pass, uh, being using crypto to actually exchange for uh, goods and services in the real world um, really answers that question, okay? That, you know, crypto actually has a real value. And right now we are the market leader in this, so. Um, yeah. So who are we looking for to grow um, FX or our company? Uh, we are looking for partners, you know, in enterprises, NGOs, governments, you know, FIs, uh, infrastructure service providers, as well as developers and startups. And uh, I think I have quite a bit of time or a little bit of time left. Um, so. Right now, I'll be doing a live demo and how, um, you know, I'll be using a, a FX core uh, CRI client command line interface. So this command line interface is uh, spun up using an instance with Ali Cloud, and also I'll be using the FX wallet. So uh, you won't be able to see my interaction with this, but later I can show you how to download and maybe take a look at it. And also I'll be using the function X Explorer to really track my transactions. Okay. So. Let me just. Okay, so this is my uh, team's web page and also uh, just a bit of background as well. Like if you search into community, the forum and, you know, uh, Discord as well, these two um, social media outlets are actually also running on a 
uh, Ali Cloud instance. So I mean, just to show you that you know, uh, within a blockchain network, uh, cloud um, cloud services are very important as well. Okay, so we are going to interact with uh, the explorer. So this is like a, a blockchain explorer. And if you want to, let's just jump over to validators and we'll just take a look. So right now we have a few um, public validators that have been spun up. And we also have uh, some institutions that have joined us like uh, European University Cyprus and also ABI. Uh, they are just one of the key speakers today as well. So right now I'll be actually uh, sending a real transaction using real money uh, to this instance. So this instance, uh, as you can see, Alibaba Cloud, right? So this is based in uh, Virginia and US. So, I mean, based on demo purposes, just take it that, you know, I'll be sending real money from Singapore to uh, US. All right. So, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll be interacting with the FX wallet right now, and we should be able to see the transaction on this screen, on this blockchain explorer. Uh, let's just click into transactions. Okay, give me one minute, one nine. Okay, so I've just used uh, the FX wallet to actually send a transaction uh, using uh, across, you know, um, using the blockchain technology. And yes, you can see a new transaction has just appeared. All right, so I've just actually sent five FX across the globe from Singapore to uh, Virginia. So right now I'll be using the client interface to send back the, I'll send back four FX to my wallet. Okay, so right now I'll be using a hardware wallet and I'll be logging in. Okay, so I've already logged in and I'll be sending the money, all right, back to FX14P. Okay, so this is my wallet address. Okay, just added layer of security. Okay, and then I'll be signing the transaction using, okay, hold on. Okay, so I'll be signing the transaction using my hardware wallet because it's more secure to save uh, any kind of um, um, money or cryptocurrency in a wallet that's not connected to the internet. Okay, so I'll just sign the transaction and you can see the transaction actually went through. So just wait for a moment and I'll be able to see right here. I just sent four FX from Virginia back to Singapore. So this really shows, you know, cross-border payment. We can just look into the, uh, this uh, amount. Um, yeah, and we can just see the transaction fee is 0 0.3. That, so right now, you know, uh, it costs about 30 cents to do a cross-border payment across the world. So you can really see how, you know, blockchain is, is redefining the way, you know, borderless payment uh, is done. All right, so I think that's it for my demo today. Uh, I'll pass the time back to you. Um, sure. Thank you, Richard, um, for a very insightful and also um, we were able to learn about the 
um, easy tracker, oh, sorry, for the blockchain ecosystem and platform as well as the demo. And next we will be having Daniel Laverick from Zulik Pharma um, and he will be talking about the easy tracker and blockchain application in pharmaceutical industry. And just a quick reminder, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in the um, chat box. So um, the speakers will be able to help answer the questions as well. Thank you. Um, the floor is all yours, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, allow me to share my screen. And a second, okay. Please let me know when when you can see it. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Is that okay? Um. Yes, I think okay. it's okay. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so before I, I jump in, I, I'll start with a very quick, uh, a quick video. Uh, video. I think it's um, yeah, just a, a minute or so long, just to set the scene of, of what we actually are doing. So, built by Zulig Pharma, an award-winning distributor in Asia, Easy Tracker is an end-to-end -end blockchain solution that improves pharma supply chain connectivity and traceability for patient safety. Easy Tracker helps pharma manufacturers, healthcare professionals, and patients via an increase in security and compliance, greater transparency and scalability through these four areas. Secure data management with clear chain of custody, ease of verifying product authenticity, and reporting incidents. Ensure optimal temperatures for vaccines by accessing secure and accurate temperature reports with quality assurances. Track, trace, and obtain reports of potential gray market products, which can hurt patient safety and brand trust. Process payments effectively and enjoy hassle-free auto-replenishment as you track and rectify product returns and expired products. Achieve operational excellence with EasyTracker today. Visit EasyTracker.io or download the EasyTracker app on the Google Play Store or App Store. Cool, thanks. Um, so just as a recap, my name is, is Danny Laverick. Um, I'm the Vice President of Digital and Data Solutions at Zulu Pharma. Uh, I'd just like to thank Alibaba Cloud um, and the Blockchain Association of Indonesia for, for giving us the chance to share more about uh, blockchain and pharma. Um, and as we've just heard, I, I think today most people believe or, or maybe have an awareness that blockchain is, is solely related to fintech or cryptocurrency or, or Bitcoin. However, blockchain can be applied across many industries, including the pharmaceutical industry. And today I'll be sharing more about our efforts to combat existing pharma challenges and also the benefits blockchain uh, brings to, to pharma and healthcare partners. Uh, before I, I jump into to what we've been doing, really just a, a very quick couple of slides on, on who Zulik Pharma are. So we're one of the largest healthcare services groups in Asia. Um, we provide world-class distribution, digital commercial services, um, and really to support the growing healthcare needs in the region uh, with a mission of, of making healthcare more accessible. Quite a traditional company, you know, started 100 years ago. Um, and, uh, but today we, we, we stand at a, a company that's uh, around about $13 billion in revenue, and we have more than 12,000 employees based, based solely in, in Asia, and we're a privately held uh, company, uh, family-owned company. Um, across across Asia, you know, the Zulu Farm is is really committed to to corporate excellence and sustainability. Um, we've we've won a, a number of awards around warehousing and distribution, uh, as well as uh, as well as things like um, a platinum medal for by Echo Vardis around sustainability. Um, and so at Zulu Farm, we're constant continuously finding ways to improve health outcomes. Um, and really, how can we look at uh, caring for the environment and, and setting really high standards for product quality and integrity? Um, and as you can see, as, as the leading distributor in the region, we, we have a huge, huge kind of reach and touch points. We serve over 60,000 medical facilities. Um, we, we cover more than 500 cities uh, across Indonesia. Um, and we're the trusted distributor serving over 50 clients, and that's the, including the top 10 pharma manufacturers um, in, in the world. Um, and we continue to focus on building a robust supply chain uh, with our distribution excellence and experience. 
but really, how does this all kind of fit together with the, with the whole uh, the whole blockchain story? And and so beyond uh, being one of the top distributors, uh, we really are looking to build an integrated ecosystem that drives great value for our patients and our clients. Um, and this is from pharmaceutical clients uh, through to patients, and and really driving value at every touch point um, through first strengthening our distribution channels and then investing in our digital and data solutions. So really, what do we see as a as a as a challenge in the pharma industry? Uh, you know, in, in 2020, the the global pharmaceutical market was valued at more than 400 billion dollars, um, and um, this billion dollar or multi billion dollar industry is really drawing the attention of, of counterfeiters looking to flip the market. Uh, other challenges that we've seen include operational inefficiencies, um, which which obviously then have a direct impact impact or threat in patient safety and has an impact on, on pharma revenue. So the first challenge in the pharma industry obviously threats to, to patients, uh, patient safety. And, and obviously one of the key threats that we see, especially in, in, in this Asia, in, in this area, uh, in this market in Asia, is really around uh, gray market, market trade of counterfeit medicines. The World Health Organization uh, revealed uh, that one in 10 uh, medicines in developing countries have been uh, identified as either falsified or, or, or substandard. Uh, and that is just, uh, that, that's just scratching the surface. They think it could be as high as three in 10, uh, actually, but they just, we just don't know. There's no way of knowing um, what, what's actually out there. And then furthermore, the Pharmaceutical Security Institute found that in 2020 alone, there was an increase of more than 23% um, in the types of medicine across therapeutic categories that were being counterfeited. And besides counterfeit medicines, obviously substandard medicines also pose a threat. IATA has reported in 2020 that one in four med medicines or vaccines are degraded due to cold chain efficiencies. Um, and not just degraded, uh, there's, there's up to 50% uh, of, of vaccines are actually wasted uh, due to poor storage conditions. And if any of these medicines are taken or administered, administered obviously the consequences to, to patient safety are, are unthinkable. Uh, then the second challenge uh, in the industry is, is obviously a loss of revenue for pharma. Um, counterfeit drugs are, are really hurting uh, pharmaceutical companies around the region. Uh, in Southeast Asia alone, pharma companies have suffered losses of more than 2.3 billion in, in 2020. Um, and close to home in Indonesia, the, the Indonesian Anti-Counterfeit Society have reported losses of, of around $500 million in revenue due to counterfeit medicines in, in 2020 alone. Um, and for improper storage of, of temperature sensitive products, the, the, the number is just huge. You know, the uh, pharma industry is now uh, suffering uh, in, in excess of $35 billion globally. Um, in losses due to temperature excursions uh, of, of products that makes them basically useless and can't, and can't be um, administered. So besides uh, counterfeits and cold chain inefficiencies, the other challenges that, that we see are around uh, data integra integration among the supply chain stakeholders. As currently there's no one trustworthy platform or solution that links the various systems along the supply chain and stakeholders work in different legs or silos and there's a distinct lack of lack of collaboration. Information is captured at each stage, but not shared to other parties. Uh, and, and there's obviously a willingness to, to uh, and, and a data ownership and, 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 and uh, kind of all questions around, around what would happen if I, if I was to hand my data over to, to somebody else. And second, due to the lack of trust and trace traceability, patients, healthcare practitioners, and authorities are really starting to demand a greater quality assurance. But without a connected and integrated system, it, it's virtually impossible to be able to assure the quality of goods. For example, counterfeits can slip in through gaps in the supply chain and penetrate the market undetected due to the lack of vigilance. And one of the other challenges of the pharmaceutical industry is the lack of analytical insights. Without an interoperable system, uh, pharma leaders struggle to accurately identify and address operational inefficiencies and gaps in the, in the, in the supply chain, which could open up their business to, to greater risks and even revenue losses. So really, what did we do at, at Zulu Pharma? We, we were really determined to, to find a solution to combat these challenges. Uh, and to do so, we, we obviously needed a trustworthy solution that made product traceability um, 
possible from from farmer to patient or from plant to patient uh, this this solution is, is a must <clears throat> and, and first really how could we have one true source of data to improve data visibility and material traceability a reliable data source that allow manufacturers healthcare practitioners and patients to access and, and rely on the data with confidence Next, the solution must obviously be data compliant, uh, as valuable business or personal data will be exchanged to enable traceability. So there must be a secure way or secure data management to build trust. And, and lastly, the solution must be able to provide useful and, and insightful analytics for, for pharma manufacturers to, to help them to be able to tackle their operational inefficiencies. You know, having a consolidated dashboard uh, it really could help leaders to identify critical information and, and to be able to pinpoint the discovery of grey market products and potential counterfeits into the market. So uh, true, to, to, true to Zulu Pharma's mission, we wanted to use blockchain as a solution that would make safe healthcare more accessible. As I mentioned, with one in 10 medicines being counterfeited and millions of dollars in revenue being lost by pharma manufacturers each year but really our our, our solution uh, is an end-to-end -end blockchain solution that we named easy tracker uh, this provides instantaneous material traceability to combat this growing, th growing threat uh, the solution so far has been rolled out in our, our key asian markets uh, we, we're now live in in hong kong thailand korea and malaysia and uh, our team has worked closely with farmer leaders to to really address these unique challenges um, and in our efforts to engage patients and build brand trust, uh, we've we've got a very simple mobile app that serves as a product information verification tool. Um, and uh, Easy Tracker Mobile now has, has more than one, thirty thousand active users, uh, and it's scanned been used approximately one hundred thirty thousand times to to do product scans. So really, um, using blockchain. What we've been able to do is that all four legs in the supply chain can now be connected and and what we've been able to achieve is to really transform the ecosystem from individual silos to a connected uh, near real-time solution with end-to-end -end product traceability um easy tracker can, can integrate with, with systems seamlessly uh, and it obviously gives stakeholders access to information with ease to allow them to to kind of look at these these operational uh, inefficiency uh, operational excellence and, and maybe target some of the operational inefficiencies So uh, how have we been able to really address, address the challenges? Um, and so with, with blockchain at the core and, and underpinning the solution, um, Easy Tracker's various applications uh, have been able to benefit the, the, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, firstly, we, we started this and it was really to address the challenge of, of counterfeits. Um, the blockchain ledger enables us to track and trace and verify products throughout the supply chain and really to create confidence that products are quality assured. <clears throat> Um, Easy Tracker also tracks grey markets uh, and, and um, or grey market imports uh, and to reduce revenue loss and really strengthen brand trust uh, within local with local regulations. Second, um, to try and target uh, or, or, or tackle the sub suboptimal storage conditions of drugs, we, we've now integrated blockchain with, with temperature loggers. So starting to take the solution one step further and, and capture IoT uh, data in the supply chain. Um, and pharma databases really have to improve the visibility of products in the cold chain. And um, so now all products, uh, all, all stakeholders can now verify products, storage and delivery uh, temperature conditions for quality assurance, as well as being able to verify the authenticity of, of, of the product. Thirdly, we apply blockchain to improve operational efficiencies in clinics. Um, the solution itself it really helps monitor inventory uh, demand and automate the replenishment of processes, uh, replenishment process for, for clinics. Uh, this minimizes out of stock medicines and really saves time and resources without having to have the, the, the whole manual effort of, of having to resubmit an order um, because you see that the stock is low or stock is actually uh, actually um, yeah, being used and, and you don't have anything left. And lastly, to make uh, product information more accessible for, for patient education, EasyTracker enables a switch um, of 
product information leaflets from paper to digital. Um, and so this is something that, that we're now working on um, with, uh, certainly it's something we're looking at in, in Singapore. And uh, so really how do we replace the paper leaflet inserts that you see inside a, a packet of uh, a, a product or a, a pharma, pharma drug product, um, replacing it with a, a blockchain based um, solution where you can scan the code and, and then look at this, this online. Uh, this is this is both obviously from a from a sustainability perspective. This this would be be huge if we can uh, if we can make steps into this uh, into this area because the the wastage that we see from uh, from the paper leaflets is is quite uh, considerable. So really, the the key uh, the key features. Um, can be or the four four key features can be customized for, for pharma companies um, and really unlock value um, for, for the pharma leader for our pharma leaders. Firstly, as an alternative to building an in-house team, which can be costly and time consuming, pharma companies can rely on Easy Tracker for support and focus on strategic initiatives uh, instead of giving instead. And obviously that gives them peace of mind um, and it helps pharma leaders optimize resources at a, at a lower cost. Secondly, Easy Tracker unlocks innovation um, for the pharma companies. It gives access, uh, give it, gives secure and seamless access to, to data management through the blockchain and cloud. Um, and they can now access analytics easily and rely on trusted system that, that's been deployed, deployed in, in multiple regions across Asia. So often we get asked uh, really for, for Easy Tracker why was was blockchain chosen, uh, and I think we've, we've been to it in the in the, um, in the in the previous presentations as well. Uh, but there was five core reasons or five main reasons why why we looked at, at blockchain for the for the solution. Obviously, first, <clears throat> blockchain uh, ledger technology really ensures high data integrity, security, and compliance. And, and in the pharma industry, and uh, this is this is obviously quite crucial. Um, a universal view of information from a, a single source really helps us to build trust within within all the all the stakeholders, um, and to protect business data. Obviously, only those authorized in, in the business are allowed access to sensitive data in the ledger. Uh, if we're looking at personal data from clinics and patients, you know, we we're also able to securely uh, store this, encrypt it, uh, and and it's stored in accordance with with local regulations. Second, um, the blockchain uh, infrastructure uh, builds, builds trust and integrity um, to achieve end-to-end -end traceability with trustworthy data. Blockchain ensures that the data cannot be easily altered or deleted. So all transactions are captured within the blockchain network. Uh, and obviously they are, they are secure, uh, authenticated and, and, uh, and verifiable. And as we start to, to kind of move on to, to this journey, you know, the other benefits uh, around scalability, transparency, and accountability, they all start to start to come into play as we see the adoption start start to grow in, on, on the network that we're we're building. So, really, uh, how what what is uh, what is Easy Tracker, and, and and how does the um, uh, how does the solution uh, kind of all fit together? Um, and so, the, the first component is um, the the Easy Tracker blockchain network. Uh, and this is the core of our solution. Um, Easy Tracker blockchain uh, enables non-intrusive data exchange, real-time traceability, and, and data security. Um, and from our, our blockchain, pharmaceutical manufacturers can can benefit from Easy Tracker digital IDs, uh, which is really uh, serialization information, which is entered onto the blockchain, and it's, it's tagged to each product um, and their operation activities, our operations activities, and the data points in the supply chain journey. Pharma manufacturers can also benefit from, from the third solution uh, component, uh, which is um, easy tracker operations. And what this does is it really allows us to, to integrate various warehouse systems uh, like SAP uh, and JDA to our, our blockchain and provide predefined operational processes for, for seamless adoption. Fourth component is, is uh, really is all around um, the data analytics or easy trackers uh, analytics. And this is where leaders can use our proprietary dashboards to extract and analyze the data tagged to each unique item. Um, and for, for healthcare practitioners, our fifth component um, is really what we call easy, easy tracker connectors. And, and this allows you to integrate uh, seamlessly or very easily with, with clinics and hospital systems to tag dispensing activities to each product. And finally, there's uh, there's obviously a very neat, real need there to protect our patients. Um, so, so Easy Tracker mobile app empowers them to verify if their medicine is from a, an authorized source, 
and it's in the right place and then to report fakes uh, as and when they are de uh, detected. So really to make traceability possible in the supply chain, uh, Easy Tracker had to design a, a blockchain infrastructure that allows for seamless and secure data transfers. Uh, and so what we see now is that different manufacturers have their own data management systems. Um, and so in order to obtain the data and upload it into the Easy Tracker blockchain, we can easily use a, an, extract, an extract, transform and load or ETL system. Um, as well as API is also a convenient way to be able to interface or upload data securely onto, onto the blockchain. Once, um, once blockchain receives the data, it will uh, perform a, a smart contract uh, verification and then we update the data to the, to the ledger. Uh, and this makes sure that the data is accurately captured and um, securely shared to all the partners in the blockchain network. Um, and that allows us to really be able to facilitate this end to end product traceability. Uh, to easily and quickly bring up a blockchain node for participants is uh, with a cost efficient manner. You know, cloud computing is obviously the best, best solution for this. Um, and uh, a cloud native infrastructure together with all the elastic services really offers us flexibility, scalability, and, and the security aspect that we, we're looking for. So one, one cloud solution that we're working with right now is, is obviously Alibaba Cloud. Um, and through Alibaba Cloud DataWorks and, and API, large data files can be transferred with high stability and reliability. Uh, DataWorks offer, also, offers us, also offers control over data permissions and, and security management. Um, obviously, Alibaba's cloud container services uh, for Kubernetes offers high performance, um, uh, high performance management services uh, and really, obviously, enterprise level containerized applications. And, and this makes it suitable for integration with, with EasyTracker. So the data can now easily flow from warehouse systems into, into the blockchain. And lastly, as the data flows to, to various stakeholders via nodes, uh, key data like expiry dates and temperature data are stored in the blockchain ledger. While master data and metadata are stored in affordable and trustworthy off ledger databases like Alibaba's Polar DB. Uh, clients can now trust the, that the data is visible and it's uninterrupted, untampered. And, and obviously, we then, we then get into the, the point where we, we're making full traceability possible. So uh, across a Asia, you know, Easy Tracker has been, been used to improve operational efficiency efficiencies and to combat counterfeits. Uh, and here's a few of the, the kind of the case studies of, of where we are live. This is this is not a, a kind of a pilot or a proof of concept. It, it, it's uh, live, it's being used um, in, in, in all the markets that, that we're currently live in. So in Hong Kong, uh, we're part of a, a tripartite uh, with a pharma client uh, manufacturer and a, a clinic management system. And this collaboration involves automating inventory, reordering processes, and then really looking at and analyzing patient behavior. Uh, in Korea, uh, Easy Tracker, we, we collaborated there with, with the pharma principal, as we call them, or manufacturer, to explore using temperature traceability to improve operational efficiencies. And um, we designed a solution which, which really tracks products via serialized information, and we're tagging the, the temperature uh, and logistics information across the chain, a cold chain. And this really is, is essential to making a traceability possible from, from the warehouse to the cold room and, and ensuring that that uh, things like vaccines uh, and certainly things like COVID vaccines are, are transported in, in the right temperature conditions. Um, and finally, in Thailand, we, we are helping a, a beauty uh, injectable manufacturer uh, deliver greater quality assurance by educating customers on, on how best um, how best to verify that the injectables that they uh, are about to take are authentic or not. Each one of these has, has really been to, to kind of address a, a very pressing need in, in the market uh, where, where we've seen counterfeits uh, kind of flooding, uh, flooding the market and causing really, really some kind of uh, very, very terrible results. So um, with, with the blockchain, uh, with, with, with the use of blockchain really connecting pharma to, to patients, um, we can now organize and present captured data on, on dashboards for, for the uh, pharma leaders. Um, and really these dashboards, they can be customized um, uh, to the needs of the business and, and to help the best serve their needs. Uh, the reliability of the data, um, pharma leaders can now make decisions with greater confidence and better understand the, the needs within the, the, their supply chain.
and this this previously was was just not it, we were just not able to do it because the data was was obviously kept or stored in in these silos uh, and and having this blockchain network has now enabled us to break down down those silos. And so, really, some of the benefits our clients uh, have seen um, from access to the dashboards really include uh, material traceability um, uh, through 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 charts, tables, graphs, or whatever we 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 can give them there. Um, and first, you know, we they're able to monitor their operations uh, and access an overview of the warehouse activities. The, the, the dashboard really provides uh, warehouse managers the ability to gain more in-depth insights through the data monitoring in real time. And so the products um, and how they're being dispatched and the status along the supply chain. And that from there, you can then start to obviously um, identify any efficiencies. You can work with your clients to uh, advise them if there's any going to be any disruptions to, to the ETA of the delivery. Second, uh, obviously, family, family leaders can now uh, view their product journey. So by serializing the products that pass through Easy Tracker, we really now allow a close monitoring of the products in the warehouse down to the individual pack level. So clients can now access the captured data, product data, and really have a visibility from plant to patient uh, at a very granular level. Uh, and obviously, this improves the data transparency, builds trust in the product. Um, and clients can, can also monitor products closely, flag those that are potential counterfeits in the respective markets, even to the extent that if there's a product recall, we, we can obviously uh, um, do very targeted alerts to those, to those, um, to those individuals who, who've had the, the products dispatched to them. Um, and obviously, besides material traceability, um, really, pharma leaders can, can also benefit from, from detailed product analysis. Uh, this data allows clients to better understand user behavior uh, by analyzing geolocation and times of interaction between the products and, and the users. Clients can observe where the products are, uh, where they are, where they're being consumed, and how better to target those markets. The data also empowers pharma uh, manufacturers by providing them the right tools and data in their investigations, uh, investigation efforts. So geolocation, geolocation mapping and flagging suspicious scan behavior, some of the key intelligence of Easy Tracker um, that we provide to authorities and, and their teams. And really this helps to protect the product integrity, uh, brand trust, and, and ultimately uh, the, the, the revenue. And, and the reason that we really kind of uh, started this entire journey is really to be able to empower patients um, and healthcare practitioners. And, and so we have a very simple user-friendly mobile app available uh, in all the stores for instant verification of the, of the product uh, source and the storage conditions. Through a scan, uh, verification is made, uh, is made easy as data is quickly extracted from the blockchain first. Uh, the patient can, can track and trace or trace and track a registered product um, and, and the source. And second, users are notified if a, if a product distribution source is not recognized by, by Easy Tracker or, or it's not found on the blockchain. And this really is to, to help identify potential counterfeits and, and then allow a channel for users to be able to report such incidents uh, through, the, through the app. And, and lastly, for temperature sensitive products, the users can verify the product storage conditions. Um, and so the Easy Tracker blockchain will, will capture the scans, uh, their location, uh, and with this, it, it helps us to uh, really work with our clients to better understand patient behavior and how they're interacting with the products. And finally, I'm just going to end with a, with a very uh, quick video so you can see um, the mobile, mobile application in, um, in action. So uh, this was about 30 seconds. As we navigate ongoing concerns about global health, how can we be assured that the medical products we use are genuine and stored safely before they reach us? To improve consumer confidence and safety, Zulik Pharma has launched Easy Tracker, an innovative and secure blockchain solution. With just one scan, we can track and verify if your product is safe for you, delivering unparalleled levels of quality control and compliance you can trust. Verification is now made easy in the palm of your hand. Download the Easy Tracker app today. An easy solution for your peace of mind. As we know. Sorry. So I really I, I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the time and um, and really learn more about how blockchain application is, is being used in, in the farm industry. I'd like to say thank you for, for, for giving me this time and the opportunity. 
Um, if you're interested or anybody's interested to explore how, how we could collaborate further uh, with us, please uh, reach out to us. Um, obviously, the, we have an email there at easytracker at zulikpharma.com. Or, or you can, um, we, are, we obviously have a presence in, in Indonesia. Um, uh, so, yeah, we'd be happy to, to, to talk more. And, and the APL uh, representative is, is um, details are there. So thank you very much. And, and thank you for giving me the, the, the time to share today. Wow, what a very insightful and very interesting topic from Daniel. Thank you so much, Daniel. So um, during his um, session, we were able to know on how connecting all stakeholders in the supply chain, as well as how Easy Trackers um, tackles different challenges in the pharmaceutical industry. So um, with that, we will be having um, our last session, which is panel discussion. And the topic, it will be about Beyond Crypto. And um, the moderator for today will be from Pinky. So everyone, if you have any questions um, for, for each speaker, please feel free to drop it in the question, uh, sorry, in the chat box below. And later on, we will be addressing it um, at the end of the panel discussion. Um, over to you, Pinky. Yes. Uh, hi, hi all. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, thank you so much to participate in this event. I'm Pinky from Alibaba Cloud as head of financial business. So today I'm as a moderator for panel discussion. So uh, here we have the speaker, Derek Loy as general manager, international business intelligent technology group from N Group. And then Richard Ng as blockchain developer from Pundi X Labs. And Daniel Everick as VP of digital and data solution from Zulik Pharma. So thank you so much for the presentation about blockchain. That's really interesting. I heard about connecting the dots between treaties, tokenization, trust and trade, blockchain ecosystem and platform, blockchain application in pharmaceutical industry. So, uh, and now let's continue to the panel discussion. We will have some discussion based on the list question. So the topic Darwin already mentioned, uh, beyond crypto. So um, yeah, blockchain technology has been uh, surrounded by plenty of hype, which makes many business leaders keenly interested in adapting it, but also concern about blockchain challenge and risk. At its most basic, blockchain refers to peer-to-peer -peer distributed large technology that can record transactions between two parties efficiently and in a variable and permanent way. Enabling tracking and traceability, this emerging technology has game-changing potential for a wide range of applications that go far beyond its roots in cryptocurrency. So uh, the question is, uh, first question, what are the challenges and misunderstanding of the blockchain industry. For example, Bitcoin is as applicable to crypto only. So uh, maybe uh, Derek can help to answer this question. Oh, Derek. Hi, Derek. Um, Seems that he I, unmuted himself, but we cannot hear him. Yeah, yeah I cannot hear you. Uh, maybe uh, while we're waiting for Derek, maybe Richard can help to answer this question. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so I would like to touch on like, um, you know, um, some misunderstandings of blockchain or crypto. So right now, you know, a lot of people or rather the mass market right now, they what they hear about crypto or blockchain is, you know, Elon Musk tweets, or, you know, if they read the newspaper, they'll see like how this 13 year old boy is able to use NFTs to earn millions, you know, and then you're just sitting back at home wondering uh, what you're doing in your day job, right? Why, how come this 13 year old boy can be earning so much more than you? So, and it also um, begs the question like, uh, you know, like uh, fundamental versus technical analysis. So, you know, um, like, you know, the latest Squid Game, right? It's all basically about hype, uh, the Squid Coin. So uh, basically the price just goes up. Everyone jumps on a bandwagon, you know, and next thing, the, the people just do a rug pull. So people don't really understand what blockchain technology is, as I, I mean, the mass market. So, I mean, mainly it's because they, this is, um, they don't really understand code and, you know, they, um, you know, media is, is, is one way to really reach out to them. And the media always portrays a 
a very hyped up version of the entire crypto industry. So I think that's one of the major uh, misunderstandings that we have. Hmm. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Um, maybe uh, Daniel can help to add. Yeah, sure. Um, hmm. I think, um, you know, if you do a, a quick search around blockchain in Asia, I guess the chances are you'll see a lot of content and conferences really resolve, revolving around digital finance and, and Bitcoin. Um, uh, however, you know, beyond Bitcoin, uh, blockchain has been starting to be heavily invested by companies um, really uh, uh, to address uh, enterprise scale problems. Um, and, and so this this is um, I kind of trying to break this misconception that it, it's only related to uh, to crypto or, or Bitcoin. Um, and we're now seeing, seeing this kind of um, becoming commonplace you know a few years ago it was maybe uh, blockchain would have been seen as as quite a hype um, and and there was a, maybe a lot of naysayers out there who say it's, it's going to be kind of a flash in the pan it's just going to kind of uh, it's not going to go anywhere but now it's actually becoming a, a standard um, it, and really being able to in the industry that that, that we're that i'm in and obviously in the pharma, pharmaceutical uh, supply chain being able to to kind of break down these these silos and, and be able to offer an end-to-end um transparency uh, of, of the supply chain is is kind of key to that um, and but building out a, an ecosystem and, and really um uh, playing on the on i guess the, the strengths of of blockchain around its immutability and its security uh, things like that still take a little bit of, of an education process uh, i don't think we're, we're there yet but we're starting to see it being more readily adopted adopted into into kind of enterprises rather than it being seen as a, as more of a, a, a kind of a fancy uh, fintech type solution mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay okay got it thank you thank you daniel uh, and then maybe derek uh, can help to add more sure uh, i hope you can hear me now yes i can hear you now awesome awesome yeah just now i i had to uh you know, put on my headset because uh, I was in office, but now I managed to get into it. Um, you know, so the, the reality is this, right? Um, you know, definitely there is uh, more to, to blockchain than just crypto. And and I think N Group and, and uh, N Chain is a very good example of that because right from the beginning, I've mentioned clearly that uh, N Chain does not uh, do anything with cryptocurrency uh, with payment tokens, right? So I've made that clear right at the beginning. But yeah, at the same time, you know, we have experienced uh, huge growth uh, in, in our business uh, with regards to how we have uh, applied, uh, you know, real world use cases of blockchain uh, with regards to tokenization, with regards to uh, traceability, with regards to uh, supply chain finance, uh, you know, which secures cross-border payment. Um, and last but not least, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about copyright and content protection, right? So these are all practical use case that is not crypto, right? But that is now, uh, you know, definitely seeing a need because a lot of transaction has gone online and therefore there's a need for digital trust, which is enabled by the characteristics of blockchain. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure that I, I say this clearly that, um, you know, we are very focused and we have seen, you know, tremendous growth in these areas. Um, uh, and, and these are practical world, uh, use case that I would love to discuss more with, uh, you know, anybody that, that is interested. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek, to add a more point on this. So uh, thank you so much for the answer about challenge and misunderstanding of the blockchain industry. Um, so yeah, uh, for the next question, like we all have heard at least one description of what blockchain is, and perhaps that description had something to do with money or cryptocurrency. But blockchain technology has broader application than cryptocurrency. In the future, blockchain technology could be a part of many everyday business to business transactions, including those powered by enterprise application. So the next question is, what are the application of blockchain in different scenario? Yeah, maybe uh, Daniel can help to answer. 
Yeah, um, definitely. You know, I, obviously, I'm coming from a, from a very different angle. Um, it, for me, uh, and and the kind of the industry that, that we're in, it's all about um, supply chain um, transparency. I guess you, you could say, um, and so that can be everything through to what I touched on around uh, products track and trace. Um, it could be cold chain monitoring. It could be kind of auto, auto replenishment. I think um, the key one for, for really, really for us is that once we build up this um, this end to end ecosystem um, and and really uh, connect uh, multiple players uh, into into this blockchain network, the use cases themselves just just kind of keep on keep on coming and, and kind of falling over themselves. Um, and so for me, you know, if if we could get to a situation where a patient can can verify uh, the authenticity of a product, can verify the quality that that product was stored and delivered in, then what's to stop us then uh, automatically triggering uh, a bank payment or automatic payment or, or some sort of supply chain financing uh, takes into place. And basically we, we then have a closed uh, loop um, kind of network or ecosystem where there's no real human in intervention need needing to take place. Nobody needs to send an invoice. Nobody needs to go and pay into the bank. Everything can be automated and, and kind of verified through, through smart contracts. Um, I think we're a little bit away from that, but I, this is the kind of the vision that, that we're trying to build uh, with with uh, with the solution. I think first was was obviously to build this this network, uh, build this backbone um, uh, to get the adoption and scale, and then after that the, we we starting to see the use cases uh, kind of kind of uh, fall 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 off from from what we've been building. Mm, I see. Okay, um, Garrett, maybe uh, Derek can add more on. Um, the answer yeah absolutely um you know i think i think there is from what i'm hearing right in terms of the questions um, it is important to also recognize that uh, a lot of uh, real world use cases doesn't resolve revolve around a single technology right i think sometimes mm -hmm. there tend to be too much expectation uh, around the fact that blockchain can save the world. Uh, you know, let me be the first to say that, no, that's not the case. Uh, it, it, it is about, uh, you know, the combination of the right uh, categories of solutions that really then solves a real world problem, right? So, you know, for, for N Group, right, for N Chain, we, 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 we do have a very broad portfolio uh, you know, of industry use cases. I mentioned 50 plus and growing. And, you know, the way we solve those uh, industry uh, real world problems is by combining blockchain with AI, uh, you know, uh, intelligent IoT, uh, you know, uh, so analytics, so and so forth, right? That then, you know, really helps to address a specific issue. And I think this is yeah. something that I want to make clear here, right? Um, yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about one technology, right? It is actually about combining multiple technologies, solutioning it, addressing it, uh, mapping it to the customer's business problems, and then coming up with a balance between cost and price that then allows for an ROI. So I think that, that is something which I really want to emphasize again and again, and that's the approach that we have taken. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and then maybe uh, Richard can help to answer. Actually, um, yeah, just to add on and Derek's point as well, like, you know, mm -hmm. I think we are at the stage where, you know, blockchain has kind of proven itself. Uh, there is a viable and um, advanced kind of technology. But also, you know, uh, we should also take note that, yeah, it, can't, I mean, using blockchain technology, you can't save the world. I mean, a lot of companies, you know, tend to just think that, okay, I'll just throw in the blockchain technology into my ecosystem and, wow, I can see the share price go up by 10, 20%. But that, I mean, in reality, that's not really the case. Like, um, we really need to assess, you know, whether, um, whether, you know, using blockchain technology is a viable thing, like whether we should store something on chain or, whether you should do it off-chain or whether it should be a private or public blockchain. And also, um, you know, I think blockchain technology is still in its infancy. Like even just look at Ethereum, right? You have um, uh, uh, ERC-20 standards and then now you have ERC-721 standards, uh, which, you know, uh, create your NFTs. So 
the blockchain technology and anything uh, related to this also um, is slowly evolving and slowly advancing. So, you know, we'll slowly see more applications of it in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the answer. So uh, we'll all learn about the combining multiple technology, addressing it and coming up with the balance and also the combination of the right category solution. And I thank you so much for the answer. So um, the next one is like the blockchain technology is taking the world by storm. Blockchain with its decentralized, transparent, and secure nature has emerged as a technology for the next generation of numerous industrial applications. So one of them is Cloud of Things, enabled by the combination of cloud computing and Internet of Things. In this context, blockchain provides innovative solutions to address challenges in cloud in terms of decentralization, data privacy, and network security, while cloud over elasticity and scalability functionalities to improve the efficiency of blockchain operation. So the, the next question is, how do platform and cloud play a role in it? Maybe uh, yeah, Richard can help to answer. Oh, OK. Uh... Yeah, so I actually did a live demo just now and, you know, uh, we actually spun up a few validator nodes. So validator mm -hmm. nodes are basically, um, you know, full nodes inside the ecosystem. So uh, an entire full node will have the snapshot of the entire blockchain data as well as the current state. So that really, um, you know, if you're part of the ecosystem with a validator node, uh, you can make transactions. And you know you can participate in governance as I have shown just now as well. Mm -hmm. So um, especially you know with uh, the blockchain world transitioning from you know uh, blockchain 1.0 to blockchain 2.0, whereas mm -hmm. um, the older versions were mainly proof of work, and now it's all proof of stake. So that's why the reduce in hardware requirements and power less power intensive uh, blockchains. So that really pushes for more. Um, you know, cloud services, you know, anyone or everyone can just spin up a, a cloud instance and uh, join an ecosystem. You don't need to have GPUs or ASICs to join like the, the Bitcoin uh, network anymore. I, yeah, you can start using cloud services to spin up validator nodes and join the new like uh, Function X blockchain. Yeah, yes, I uh, agree with that. Maybe um, Derek can help to add. Absolutely. Um, so this is a very good question in a sense that, um, you know, this is another real world practical use case for blockchain where we have seen that uh, being integrated with, uh, you know, analytics and with, uh, you know, uh, edge computing. So we actually enable, uh, you know, IoT to be a lot more uh, relevant, right? And a lot more uh, interactive. So so let me, let me explain what I mean, right? So um, you know, IoT is more about just sensors, right? It's more about just uh, collection of data. Uh, it's the ability to actually uh, analyze uh, and extract insight from those data that's collected by the edge sensors, and then to, um, you know, provide a feedback, right? Or a response, right? In almost near real time, uh, that then allows uh, the, the interaction, right? Uh, to, to bring additional value Right to the consumers, right, or to, to the customers that are age, and this has been uh, brought about, uh, you know, or this has been made possible due to a couple of innovation in recent years, right. So first and foremost, you know, the rollout, the event, the gradual rollout of five G, right, uh, has actually provided the perfect uh, conduit uh, at the edge of the network now, where there's a higher bandwidth, there's a lower latency, which allows for that, um, you know, that bandwidth intensive. But latency sensitive, right? Uh, interaction that uh, that is so much uh, needed for the feedback loop from IoT. Secondly, is also about the fact that um, there's uh, edge computing, which now introduce a level of uh, computing power to the edge, right? And this then allows for the processing that's needed in order to do the analysis and in order to provide the real time response. Thirdly. Uh, you know, and N Group has made a lot of advancement in this area. Uh, we have also uh, integrated uh, AI as well as blockchain into, uh, you know, IoT chipsets, right, that, uh, and IoT devices, which therefore now allows for that 
uh, one-stop shop processing, right, of the data that's collected by the census, uh, you know, together with applying the right, uh, you know, blockchain capabilities in order to provide that uh, secure transaction and immutability, you know, right to the edge of the platform or right to the edge of, uh, you know, the data platform. Then last but not least, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about the fact that, uh, you know, end of the day, um, it is all about interoperability. And this is where, uh, you know, N Group has also developed, uh, you know, beyond the usual census, right? Uh, the, the RFID text that we are also familiar with. Uh, we have also uh, worked with a lot of other sensors uh, and hardware partners to actually develop the, the right APIs, the cloud APIs, the device SDKs that works with such third party uh, sensors and devices. And that to us, is really where you now combine the best of both worlds, right? You have the sensors, you have the edge computing and the chipsets, you know, uh, that now comes with uh, these capabilities. And then you have the platform and the ledger, you know, being, uh, you know, now available, right? Through the specialized API so that they can do an API call, you know, to, to this uh, analytics and uh, this uh, blockchain platforms. So that, that is something that uh, has enabled us, for example, to, uh, to automate the entire uh, manufacturing uh, uh, for uh, Cherry, uh, a car manufacturer, where we have automated the entire supply chain uh, to be just in time and to also be, allow them to be more agile, right, in customizing uh, certain of the car features uh, for their customers. Uh, another area which uh, we have also enabled this, uh, you know, AIoT, is in the area of uh, shipment. All right, so gone are the days when you need people to literally track, you know, the containers that are coming in, you know, the cartons that are coming in. Now with the right uh, AI uh, and IoT uh, blockchain that's infused into the third-party uh, cameras uh, through our cloud API, we are able to actually introduce uh, introduce uh, geo uh, fencing uh, and automated detection of all these cartons and containers as they go through international ports. Right, international borders. And this again really helps to introduce that end-to-end uh, -end automation. It speeds up uh, you know, the, the, the supply chain finance uh, and it allows us to then give more trust back to our customers. So I, I just want to you know, highlight that um, you know, sometimes it's about convergence and now we have that perfect convergence of uh, 5G, of uh, you know, all these uh, AI and IoT and blockchain capabilities all coming together as well as the introduction of uh, APIs and SDK, which then makes for interoperability to be easier. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Derek, for the great answer. And maybe Daniel want to add uh, something? Yeah, I, I, there's not much to left out. I think Derek covered it pretty pretty well. But um, I guess um, really, you know, both blockchain and, and, and cloud, I guess they are distributed in, in nature. Um, and so really for, for blockchain solutions like Easy Tracker, you know, cloud really allows for seamless sharing of information across the various nodes and, and the stakeholders. Um, you know, we see now patients, healthcare practitioners, authorities, they, they all are demanding greater assurance and data and data protection. So having blockchain and cloud really strengthens the data management and gives consumers peace of mind, you know, knowing that their, their data will not be mishandled or abused. Now, if we can take that one step further and we build on to, to the blockchain network, you know, we can now look at things like uh, fog computing or we can look at confidential computing. So how do we even take this one level further to make sure that the security and, and compliance is, is there and, and, and kind of building out that, that, whole, um, that whole confidence in, in, the, in the blockchain network that we're putting together? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for the great answer about the platform and cloud play a role in it. And then, um, yeah, next, last one, like a uh, blockchain for business is valuable for entities transacting with one another with distributed large technology permission participants can access the same information at the same time to improve efficiency, build trust and remove friction. So blockchain also allows a solution to rapidly size and scale and many solutions can be adapted to perform multiple tasks across industries. So blockchain for business delivers this benefit based on four attributes unique to the technology. So, and the last question from the panel discussion today, what are the challenge we've seen to apply blockchain in the business? So uh, maybe Derek can help to answer. Um, 
I would say that the the biggest challenges, uh, you know, I, I would say are threefold, right? So first and foremost, I mentioned about security. Uh, yeah. I spoke to start audit, uh, mm-hmm. and this is even uh, this will be even more applicable as we see a lot more cross chain or multi chain interactions, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there is a need for smart contracts to be audited so that they are aligned, uh, or should I say, they are based upon the same uh, agreement on the attributes as well as on, you know, how these attributes apply, uh, you know, when they cross the chain. Uh, the second challenge uh, that we definitely see is also the fact that, uh, um, you know, we must also recognize the fact that uh, uh, the world will not j- just be made up of uh, permission-based blockchain or public blockchain, right? It will be a combination. It's just like cloud, right? There, there, uh, there will always be multiple cloud. There's no one single cloud that will rule the world. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I would say that at this moment, uh, there's still a lot of discussion about uh, the protocol, uh, you know, how exchanges, uh, data exchanges, metadata, interoperability, you know, sharding between uh, chains uh, can be established. Uh, increasingly, uh, we do see that that is where the trend will go, that, you know, each consortium or each region or each, uh, you know, um, association will have their own uh, uh, permission-based blockchain. But in order to truly bring the benefits of blockchain, uh, you know, to uh, the population, you have to look at how the chain can be talking to each other. So I think that's the second challenge uh, that I want to highlight. The third challenge is really about um, you know, keeping the costs uh, manageable, right? Because as we all know, right, there's always a price elasticity to everything that we do, right? And at this moment, I do see that again, uh, because of either hype or speculation, uh, there is a lot of expectation. Uh, we have to measure that uh, with regards to uh, how we price this. Um, and, and, you know, I, I look forward to the day when this can be priced as a service uh, in a similar manner to uh, what we see from cloud computing today. And I'm not just referring to blockchain as a service, right? Because that is already available today. But it's more of the use cases for blockchain. How can we then price it in such a way that it becomes more accessible and more affordable and more, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, user-friendly, uh, user right? To, to the uh, commercial customers. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, maybe a Richard? can help to answer right um yeah so i mean going back to like one of the first questions right about um you know what are the challenges of blockchain as well uh, i think right now you know we we haven't really reached mass adoption yet and also there's a lot of still a lot of misunderstanding about blockchain you know people don't really see the functionalities or you know the use cases like for example in supply chain management and pharmaceutical or like, um, you know, in NFTs, um, you know, like, uh, for example, like working in this company, um, people always ask, you know, when um, your coin or your token will 3x or 4x, you know, people don't really care whether, you know, once you start a governance proposal, whether it really goes through. So I think there's kind of a mismatch between price and value. So um, people don't really understand because people don't really understand the fundamentals of a project or the entire blockchain, right? So then they, they all they see is how much hype there is. So in so doing also, you know, like um, they kind of shift, I mean, they kind of uh, shift off the, the company's focus to just focus on things that are, you know, easy to churn out or easy to, you know, um, produce or something that's very hyped up. So I think that's what uh, needs to be addressed, especially in this, uh, ecosystem and you know for mass adoption it's not just mass adoption but also like the quality of education that uh, for people to understand the projects better and to understand blockchain technology uh, better as a whole as well thanks uh, yeah uh, thanks Richard and then maybe Daniel want to add uh, some point yeah I think um, I, I really there's, there's two points there Richard touched on on one I think there is a, a distinct lack of education and awareness certainly for enterprise use um, you know blockchain is still relatively nascent uh, to, to many people um, and there's, there's really a need for, for education um, really uh, how to how people can understand its value and, and how we can learn to adopt it in, inside the business 
Um, I, so I think it's, that's really, you're starting to see companies outside the financial service industry are, are kind of exploring uh, business use cases um, to make full potential, uh, a full use of the potential, but I don't think we're anywhere near where, where it could be. Um, so I'd say that that's probably a key one. The other one for us is is really around uh, how new blockchain is. Um, so so really finding talent in in this space is is very difficult or challenging. Um, you know finding uh, blockchain engineers or, or building an in-house team it, it takes a huge amount of time. There's a, a lot of demand uh, in, in the market for the same very small pool of resources. Um, and, and obviously it's changing so fast. So these engineers, they're constantly having to keep up to date, learn new ways of blockchain, what, what's out there and how this can be applied to, to the business. And, and that's, that's not, isn't, it's not easy. Um, and, and so I guess that goes hand in hand with, um, with Derek's comment about trying to keep this cost effective. You know, it's um, certainly in the pharma industry, it's uh, margins in, in kind of distribution are very, are very small. So how do we make sure this is cost effective, that it doesn't become a barrier um, to adoption or barrier to, to be able to scale, um, scale the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel. So yeah, thank you so much for the answer about the challenge we've seen to apply blockchain in the business. So we all know that the challenge, like the people don't really see and understand, and then people don't really know about the between price and value, and also uh, about the lack of education, and then security and keeping the cost manageable. Thank you so much for all the great uh, answer. So uh, I think that's the ending of the panel discussion today. Thank you so much for the panelists for the great answer and explanation. So um, thank you. And then back to Darlene. Darlene? Sure. Thank you, Pinky, and uh, the speakers for the panel discussion. I think um, we were able to learn a lot of different things, yeah, especially because blockchain um, is something new in Indonesia. So I think a lot of the audiences are able to learn about um, different things too. So um, we have a few questions for the speakers and maybe we can answer um, some of them. So first of all, um, we have from Haisheng. So NFT is a big story. Can I ask how many arts and value in Ant blockchain now? Uh, maybe Derek can answer that. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, you know, again, uh, I want to highlight the fact that um, for Ant, uh, you know, we, 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 we prefer to refer, we would prefer to, to name uh, NFT as digital collectibles, which, which really reflects uh, how we look at uh, NFT, you know, uh, in a more practical use case uh, uh, scenario, right? Uh, it is about uh, creating a, a unique signature that's tied to a, a digital identity or digital asset. Uh, that has obviously, you know, a real world value, right? And making sure that it's not just about the trading and the market speculation about it, but more about how we then uh, allow for such uh, digital assets and uniqueness to be valued, uh, you know, and, and to be, um, uh, you know, to, 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 be, uh, to allow them to, the owner, right? To have unique ownership uh, of this um, uh, digital assets. So that's one. Now, in terms of the number of, uh, you know, NFTs or as, uh, digital collectibles that we have on the, our Enchain platform, uh, it is growing by the day, right, for sure. Uh, I will not be able to reveal the exact figure because obviously that is of a certain competitive uh, nature. But suffice to say that, uh, you know, uh, for example, the Hangzhou uh, torch uh, that you saw earlier, uh, we produced 20,000 of that and that was sold out within like a few seconds. And you can, you can go and think about, you know, the, amount, the number of uh, uh, new releases, um, you know, every day, every week, uh, and, and you can, you can uh, uh, what do you call, postulate from there, right? So I thought at this moment, if it's okay, I, I can't share due to competitive reasons. Thank you, Derek. And then following up for the question, so I think this, these two questions can be uh, combined to one. So from Achmad, it will be, so and blockchain is private blockchain or public blockchain, and also from Haisheng, uh, maybe you can address this as well at the same time. Um, DNA protection is quite costly. Is it widely used or just for some very precious art? Thank you. Sure. Uh, so Enchain uh, comprises uh, both public blockchain, private blockchain, as well as non-blockchain capabilities such as AIoT, uh, analytics, EKYC, and so on and so forth, right? But coming back to your question, right? So um, 
you know, if we were to build a certain uh, tokenization, uh, uh, you know, capability uh, for a client, uh, that obviously will be a permission-based uh, private blockchain, right? Because it is only applicable to the community, right? That the enterprise uh, is, um, uh, you know, rolling out the tokens to. Um, you know, take for example, our traceability platform, right? Uh, we have a global traceability uh, platform for food chain, for cold chain, uh, for fabric uh, that is e ESG certified. And in all these cases, uh, it is only rolled out by that particular company, uh, you know, to their users. So those are, these are what they call private blockchain. But at the same time, we also have uh, Trustful, which is our global uh, public uh, supply chain finance platform that's built on blockchain. And that is where we have uh, a website. If you go to trustful.com, you can actually, you know, uh, uh, register an account able to make transactions on that. So that is a public blockchain. Uh, another example of a public blockchain is GSBN, a Global Shipping Business Network, which we have set up uh, to automate the entire bill of laden uh, process for cross-border shipping. So uh, this consortium uh, is uh, comprising uh, Hapaloid, uh, Costco, right, and EPSA. Uh, again, this is a public blockchain because we have recently signed on DBS, uh, HSBC, uh, who's also providing uh, uh, some of their financing uh, insurance services, uh, you know, to the shipping uh, uh, community, right? So that is a public blockchain. Um, so I will, I will say uh, a summary to my, uh, to my answer earlier, uh, it's a combination of both that we provide and it's really back to the use cases that you're working on. Um, yeah, DNA protection, uh, you know, is uh, due to, uh, you know, due to the economy of scale as well as obviously the uh, innovation uh, that Ant has uh, put into this. Uh, we have make it affordable, uh, you know, uh, not only for uh, digital art but also for digital media, uh, sound bites, uh, video clips, uh, even uh, what do you call uh, literature. Right, so our video DNA, sorry, our DNA uh, capability has been used, uh, you know, uh, you know, by a lot of digital media companies, a lot of uh, uh, what do you call uh, celebrity bloggers, a lot of um, you know, uh, uh, digital IP creation, uh, you know, or digital IP owners, to actually protect their digital assets, right? And again, there's various levels of uh, DNA, right? Uh, uh, that we can apply to then, uh, you know, allow us to and uh, to securely protect as well as uh, you know detect any infringement. Uh, so uh, you know that it is not just restricted to to precious art. Then with regards to learning of blockchain, uh, I think that's something which uh, I'm quite sure all the panelists here are very eager to to see how we can uh, work with you. All right, to to enable uh, you know the right curriculum uh, for Enchain. Uh, we are uh, we obviously have our own certification, which we will be uh, delivering in a uh, workshop, uh, a de developers conference in Q1 of next year. All right, so there's an N-Chain uh, Certified Associate uh, certification. Uh, we also work with a lot of the universities and uh, institutions uh, in this part of the world uh, to provide uh, the curriculum, the content, the trainers uh, as part of their blockchain uh, courses or fintech courses. Right, so look out for that. Um, but this is how we are. Uh, we feel right that it's important to contribute back uh, to the community uh, and to participate at the early stages where it's uh, you know it's about reaching out to students uh, and and uh, you know to, uh, adults who are continuously uh, you know interested in un in relearning and uh, you know uh, enhancing their further education. Thank you, Derek, for the um, answer. And um, for the, another question will be from Timothy. So um, this is for Z Pharma. Um, what I wanted to ask is related to healthcare. Is it possible to implement blockchain for COVID-19 test result? Since I'm very sure it can be applied in various use cases such as transportation, administrations, and et cetera. So um, maybe Daniel, you can help to answer that. Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, yeah, I didn't. One of the areas I didn't touch on actually is we we have used this um, in um, 
in COVID vaccines and COVID tests in, in the Philippines. So we have a solution called EasyVax, uh, basically built on the same blockchain network. Um, it's actually uh, administered close to one, over 1 1.5 million COVID vaccines. Um, and with that, obviously, COVID vaccine certificates uh, and COVID vaccine tests as well. Um, obviously, all block, blockchain uh, backed and able to be stored on, on an app on, on uh, the patient's phone and downloaded into the wallet. Um, so we, we, we're already using um, that solution and using the, the kind of the blockchain network um, as the backbone to support that. So um, I see that Duelic Pharma is likely to use private blockchain. Is it correct? If yes, do you use Hyperledger Fabric to develop the blockchain network or use the others? Yes, correct. Um, it's um, it's a, a private consortium, I guess, um, permission blockchain, uh, and we're using Hyperledger Fabric. Um, the reason why, obviously, some, some key benefits, certainly for, the, for our use case, um, it's obviously industry standard. Um, it, it's the level of maturity, um, and then the fact that we can obviously establish trust, reliability, and have the, the kind of throughput capability that, that we needed. So, yeah, uh, in, in short, we, it's exactly as, as described. It's a, a private blockchain using Hyperledger Fabric. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. I think that's all for the questions today. So, and thank you so much for joining. And I hope you all are staying safe.